hello and welcome to our worship service here at St. Paul Lutheran Church online. I'm Pastor Tom Goodmanson and I'll be leading you today as we examine a little bit of what the Bible says about the second coming of Jesus in the light of his resurrection from the grave. We begin our service now in the name of our triune God, asking his powerful presence upon us. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For scripture reading for today is found recorded in 1 Thessalonians, beginning at chapter 4, verse 13, reading into chapter 5, verse 11. The words of St. Paul. Brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be ignorant about those who have died. We don't want you to grieve like other people who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and came back to life. We also believe that through Jesus, God will bring back those who have died. They will come back with Jesus. We are telling you what the Lord taught. We who are still alive when the Lord comes will not go into his kingdom ahead of those who have already died. The Lord will come from heaven with a command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First the dead who believed in Christ will come back to life. Then together with them, we who are still alive will be taken in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. In this way, we will always be with the Lord. So then comfort each other with these words. Brothers and sisters, you don't need anyone to write to you about times and dates. You know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When people say, 
everything is safe and sound, destruction will suddenly strike them. It will be as sudden as labor pains come to a pregnant woman. They won't be able to escape. But brothers and sisters, you don't live in the dark. That day won't take you by surprise as a thief would. You belong to the day and the light, not to the night and the dark. Therefore, we must not fall asleep like other people, but we must stay awake and be sober. People who sleep, sleep at night. People who get drunk, get drunk at night. Since we belong to the day, we must be sober. We must put on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. It was not God's intention that we experience his anger, but that we obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us that whether we are awake in this life or asleep in death, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage each other and strengthen one another as you are now doing. This is the word of the Lord. Our gospel reading for today is found recorded in the 14th chapter of the gospel of John, beginning at verse 1, the words of Jesus. Don't be troubled. Believe in God and believe in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not true, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. Then I will bring you into my presence so that you may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. If you have known me, you will also know my Father. From now on, you know him through me and have seen him in me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please join me now as we profess our common Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Our faithful God, we thank you for your gospel promises that tell us about your fervent love for us, a love so great that it drove Jesus to the cross where he died in our place as the complete substitute payment for all of our sins. And with his resurrection from the grave, he has promised that all believers in Christ will likewise rise from the grave on judgment day when he comes again to take his family, the church, home to himself forever in heaven. Oh Lord, please pour out your Holy Spirit upon us now and teach us how to live generously and courageously as we anticipate the glorious return of our Savior. Help us to live sacrificially for others as we keep our eyes fixed upon the goal of our faith, eternal life with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Almighty and everlasting God, we ask your blessings upon our country and the people of the world. Satan <clears throat> is using the coronavirus to wreak havoc and destruction upon humanity. Please bless the work of the medical researchers as they search for a remedy to this evil. Please grant safety and protection to our medical personnel and others who are caring for those who have contracted the disease. If it is your will, grant your healing power to those who are struggling with disease in their body and to those like Phyllis who are recovering from recent surgery. Guide and direct those in government with your wisdom as they seek to make decisions that will be of benefit to all of our citizens. Comfort those who are weak or fearful, especially those who have been furloughed from their jobs or who are in danger of losing their business to bankruptcy. Teach us all to entrust our lives into your most gracious care. Oh Lord, we ask you to comfort those who are mourning the passing of their loved ones, especially pour out your spirit upon the family of Jim Cummings who died last week. May your gospel message of hope be especially sweet to them 
as they turn to you for comfort and strength. For all of these concerns and for whatever else you know us to need, we entrust it all into your gracious and all-powerful hands, summing it all up in the prayer that you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This time we're going to continue with the dedication of our offerings to the Lord and to the ministry that God has given us here at St. Paul Lutheran Church of connecting people to Christ our Savior. And I want to say a special word of thanks to all of you who have continued to generously support our church's work during this pandemic when we're unable to meet together. Your support is crucial for our staff as we continue to lead all of you in the important mission that God has given us of sharing the hope of Jesus with people throughout Sheboygan County and far beyond. Thank you also to those of you who have been able to <clears throat> give a special gift to our uh, sustenance fund that we've just started up, which is intended to help those who are losing income right now during this difficult time. We've already had some folks say that they are giving their relief checks from the government to this fund because they don't need the money themselves and they want to help others who are in need. So thank you, whatever you're able to give to this and to the regular support of our church. It's very, very much appreciated. Please join me now in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we bring before you these offerings that have come from grateful hearts. We're so thankful for the ways that you watch over us and care for us. We ask that you would bless these offerings as we put them to work through the ministry of our church. You have called us to reach out in love to everyone we possibly can with the hope of Jesus because it's the only message that will bring lasting hope to the hearts and minds of so many who are feeling so afraid right now. Bless our church's ministry efforts, guide and direct us, for we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. In this time of desperation, when all we know is doubt and fear, there is only one foundation we believe, we believe. Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit. 
We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And He's given us new life. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, as we spend some time reflecting upon your word, we ask that you would be with us. Uh, many of us are struggling with fear. We're not sure what's going on in the world around us, and we're desperate, some of us. We need the power of your spirit to guide us and direct us and to calm our fears. We ask you to pour out your spirit upon us right now, Draw us ever closer to you through a living faith in Jesus, for we ask this in his precious name. Amen. Our theme for today is preparing for the second coming of Christ. You know, the first time that it happened to me as a pastor was sometime during 1981. I was just a new pastor at Mount Calvary Lutheran Church in Huron, South Dakota, fresh out of the seminary, when a woman in a Bible study that I was leading started focusing on a few of the, the bad things that were going on in the world at that time. And then came the big question. Pastor, when I look at all of this stuff, it makes me think that Jesus is coming back again very, very soon. Don't you think so? To which a number of the other ladies in the group chimed in their agreement. That question has echoed, been echoed by many other people over the nearly four decades of my ministry. Don't you think that all of the war that's going on, don't you think the moral decline in values, don't you think the massive killing of unborn babies, don't you think all the earthquakes and the hurricanes and the wildfires and all that stuff going on, don't you think that the alarming rise of murders and other very serious crimes in our world, don't you think all of this is telling us that Jesus is going to come again very, very soon? And most recently, with the, the great disruption of our lives by the coronavirus, I've been getting that question coming again. Pastor Tom, is Jesus coming again very soon? Apparently, this was a growing question in the church in Thessalonica in Paul's day, nearly 2,000 years ago. Thessalonica was a city in Macedonia. I've got a, a map that I want to show you. We'll put it on screen for you. It shows you Macedonia, and Thessalonica is just kind of center, top center there, uh, right below the word Macedonia. This area today is modern-day Greece, North Macedonia, Bulgaria, Albania, Ser Serbia, and Kosovo. All those countries are in that region. This church was one of the many churches that the Apostle Paul had started as he went around to, to various large cities in Asia Minor preaching the gospel about Jesus Christ. And the promises of Jesus were unmistakably clear to the people. Promises like what we heard in our gospel reading for today from John chapter 14. Jesus said this the night of his betrayal. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not true, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. Then I will bring you into my presence so that you may be where I am. And then a short time later, after Jesus had died, risen from the grave, and now at the ascension of our Savior into heaven, the message of the two angels to the followers of Jesus on the Mount of Ascension, of ascension was crystal clear once again. Listen to their words. Why are you men from Galilee standing here looking at the sky? Jesus, who was taken from you to heaven, will come back in the same way that you saw him go to heaven. The message of the Bible is unmistakable. Jesus is going to come back again, and it'll happen on Judgment Day. 
The people in the church in Thessalonica certainly got that message, but they still had some questions about the second coming of Christ that Paul addresses here in our text for today from 1 Thessalonians chapters 4 and 5. There are three questions that Paul answers. The first one is, what happens to those who die when he comes, or before he comes? Secondly, how can we know when he will come? And third, how should we live while we await his coming? So let's do as Paul did and address these questions one at a time. Question number one, what happens to Christians who die before Jesus comes back again? Well, listen to what Paul tells the church. He says, brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be ignorant about those who have died. We, want, uh, we don't want you to grieve like other people who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and came back to life. We also believe that through Jesus, God will bring back those who have died. They will come back with Jesus. We are telling you what the Lord taught. We who are still alive, when the Lord comes, will not go into his kingdom ahead of those who have already died. The Lord will come from heaven with a command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, he says, the dead who believed in Christ will come back to life. Then together with them, we who are still alive will be taken in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. In this way, we will always be with the Lord. So then comfort each other with these words. You know, uncertainty about the future causes a lot of anxiety and worry in all of us because we're all fallen people who are broken by sin. And God wants the faith of Christians to overcome our worry by assuring us that we can entrust our lives now and into the future into his almighty but grace-filled hands. Now, one of the things that caused the people of Paul's day a great deal of anxiety was the false belief that Jesus was going to come again very soon during their lifetime before they would die. But the reality was that some believers had already died and family members were concerned that the dead believers might miss out on heaven since they wouldn't be alive when Jesus came back. So Paul comforts them with these words of assurance. We believe that Jesus died and came back to life. We also believe that through Jesus, God will bring back those who have died. They will come back with Jesus. We are telling you what the Lord taught. This is really important. Paul is saying, these aren't my thoughts. I didn't dream these up one day. This is what Jesus taught us. We who are still alive, when the Lord comes, will not go into his kingdom ahead of those who have already died. Our hope as Christians is unlike any other hope because it is grounded in the fact of Christ's victory over death through his resurrection from the grave. Therefore, our sorrow when a fellow Christian dies is unlike the sorrow of an unbeliever because our grief is embraced by hope. We must learn to accept death as the ultimate experience for each and every one of us. But the Christian view goes way beyond mere acceptance to anticipation of that great day when God will take us home to himself. Notice Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He writes, Our lives are guided by faith, not by sight. We are confident and prefer to live away from this body and to live with the Lord. Paul was looking forward to his physical life being over in this world so that he could go to heaven and be with the Lord forever. And writing to the Christians in Thessalonica, in our text, Paul presents the resurrection of Jesus as the guarantee that believers who have died will return with Jesus on Judgment Day. This is really, really important. Every generation of Christians is called to live in the hope of the coming of Jesus Christ again. This ultimately is what history is all about for us as believers. Our lives will find ultimate fulfillment in heaven, not on earth. That leads us to the second question. When will Jesus return? This is a question that has plagued the curious imaginations of Christians for the last 2,000 years. In our more recent times, the biblical prophecy movement within Christianity has gone crazy over this. I think the book by Hal Lindsey called The Late Great Planet Earth kicked this uh, movement into high gear. 
The book was first published in 1970 and sold tens of millions of copies. Lindsay was sure that Jesus was coming again very, very soon. In fact, this book was so popular that Hollywood made a, a movie based upon it. Listen to what Lindsay writes in the preface to the movie edition of the book. He says, rationality has replaced religion for many people. Scientists have taken the place formerly occupied by prophets. God is said to be dead, and yet there is clearly a deep underlying conviction among the American public that mysterious forces of evil are beginning to run wild in the world. As the world becomes harder to understand and the future becomes more horrible to contemplate, people once again turn to religion for the answer. Millions in this search have turned to late great planet Earth. It challenges us to think about where all our schemes and dreams have led us, to what point we have come in almost 2,000 years since the birth of Jesus. And now listen to this. He says, will we make it to the year 2000? Will we even make it to 1984? Don't make plans for 1985 until you've read the late great planet Earth. Jesus himself told his followers in Matthew chapter 24, no one knows when that day or hour will come. This is really an important statement of Jesus. Nobody knows when he's coming again. Knowing this perfectly well, the apostle Paul told the church in Thessalonica, he said, brothers and sisters, you don't need anyone to write to you about times and dates. You know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When people say everything is safe and sound, destruction will suddenly strike them. It will be as sudden as labor pains come to a pregnant woman. They won't be able to escape. One commentator says this about the church that Paul was writing to. He says, there were those in Thessalonica who had concluded that Jesus would surely come most any day. Some were apparently stirring up all kinds of excitement, and others, now get this, Others had quit their jobs to await the event. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how people would get so carried away with their emotions? That happens easily when we lose sight of the words and teachings of Jesus and we begin to make up our own ideas to fit our own hopes and dreams instead. As Jesus first said, and then Paul echoes the same thoughts to the Thessalonian Christians, he says, my friends, don't worry about when Jesus is coming back again. Just know that he will come again on Judgment Day, and we need to be focused upon preparing ourselves spiritually for that day. And that takes us to question three that Paul addresses here in our text. How should we live while we await his return? Take a look with me at Paul's words to his friends in Thessalonica. He says, but brothers and sisters, you don't live in the dark. That day won't take you by surprise as a thief would. You belong to the day and the light, not to the night and the dark. Therefore, we must not fall asleep like other people, but we must stay awake and be sober. People who sleep, sleep at night, and people who get drunk, get drunk at night. Since we belong to the day, we must be sober. We must put on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. It was not God's intention that we experience his anger, but that we obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake in this life or asleep in death, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage each other and strengthen one another as you are now doing. So what does Paul mean when he says that we are to live as people of the day and the light, not as people of the night and the dark? What does he mean when he says we must put on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet? Well, it means in the words of Jesus that we should do to others as you would have them do to you. Or put another way, Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, that he should lay down his life for his friends. We, you see, are called to live courageously and generously knowing that Jesus has also made this promise. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though he die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. So what does this kind of faith really look like in a person's life? 
Well, back in 1527, when the bubonic plague hit Wittenberg, Germany, Martin Luther refused calls to flee the city and protect himself, even though ultimately 30 to 60 percent of the population of the world was going to die of that terrible plague. Rather, he stayed and he ministered to the sick. And when he was asked by area clergy to give advice on how people should react in the midst of the plague, Luther wrote a tract that was called, Whether Christians Should Flee the Plague. In this, in this tract, there was no panic or, or hysteria. He says that Christians should not neglect their duties at home or in their communities over concerns of the illness. He insisted that we have a Christian duty to serve our neighbor at all times, even if it might bring harm to us personally, especially those in positions of leadership like pastors, governing authorities, and medical personnel. He insisted they must care for their people, whatever the risks might be. However, if their faith is weak and they can find suitable substitutes for themselves, he said such people could flee. He also said that we should be gentle with and pray for those who are afraid and for those who flee their civic duties. In summary, as Christians, we are to live in this world with our eyes fixed upon the goal of heaven through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. As he himself rose from the grave, Jesus has promised that all who trust in his life, death, and resurrection for them will also rise again to eternal life in heaven. The author of the book of Hebrews put it this way in describing the faith of the Old Testament forefathers of the faith. He said, They acknowledged that they were living as strangers with no permanent home on earth. Instead, these men were longing for a better country, a heavenly country. May God give us such confident, courageous faith that trusts in the promises of the death of Jesus as the complete payment for all of our sins and that trusts in his resurrection, the, the resurrection of Jesus and that of all believers in Christ. So that fear of contracting the coronavirus or any other sickness will not cause us to neglect our Christian duty to love others sacrificially as Jesus has done for us. Oh, certainly take precautions that are available to us, like you know, wearing masks and other protective gear around those who are infected, but continue to serve others in love because our Savior has promised, remember, I am always with you to the very end of time. May God give us such faith in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And now, let us go before our Lord in our time of confession of sins and forgiveness. You know, just before Jesus ascended into heaven, he told his followers, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance uh, for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. These were Jesus' marching orders to his church. The mission of the church must begin with our humble repentance for our sins. So together, let us confess our sins to our compassionate God. Heavenly Father, we confess to you that our sinful nature causes us to focus so much upon living life in this world that we often lose sight of the goal of heaven. In fact, we are so connected to this life that when threats to our temporal life rear their ugly heads through sickness and disease and many other forms, we become afraid of suffering and death, and then we fail to love others sacrificially. Please forgive these and all other sins of our life. Refocus our hearts and our minds upon the promise of the gospel and help us to live now in anticipation of eternal life with you in heaven. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The Apostle Peter has some wonderful words of comfort and strength for us. Gospel words. He tells us, Christ suffered for our sins once. He was an innocent person 
but he suffered for guilty people so that he could bring you to God. Isn't that a wonderful message? Jesus did it all in our place. He was the substitute payment for every single last sin of our lives. And now God has promised to all of us who have confessed our sins and are trusting in Jesus as our Savior, you are forgiven of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Receive now the benediction of our Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Thank you for joining us for worship. God bless your day. May he grant you his peace that surpasses all understanding. And may he give you great courage as you serve him with joy and gladness. Not worrying about life in this world being ending, but anxiously anticipating the wonderful gift of heaven someday. May he bless us with such faith. In Jesus' name, amen.